So hello, everybody. My name is Magnus Alpefors, and I work at the uh, Berlin Centers Communications and Coordination Team. Now we'll give you a short uh, introduction. I'll start with showing a few pictures to give you a sense of what we are doing here. So this is thawing coastal permafrost in Arctic Canada with person for scale. Swedish icebreaker Oven at the front of Pietermann ice shelf in 2019. And the ice shelf may break up if ocean warming continues. Lactirus vernus and Primus viris. Two of the species included in a study reviewing effects on different environmental factors in plant populations. And this picture is from a field excursion in Sicily, uh, examining astronomically forced climate cycles within sedimentary successions. And the picture shows the base of the Pleistocene epoch, 2.5 million years ago, and the start of the Earth's current ice age. So, as you might have guessed, the Berlin Center is a multidisciplinary consortium of over 400 scientists in Sweden that conduct research and graduate education related to the Earth's climate. Our researchers are affiliated, affiliated to one of six different departments at Stockholm University. I won't mention them all, but they are six. They can also be affiliated to FLOW at the Royal Institute of Technology, KTH for short, or the, the Rossby Center at the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute, as in Hawaii. So with this knowledge profile, we focus on extending and disseminating knowledge about the Earth's nat natural climate system, climate variations, climate impacting processes, climate modeling, human impact on the climate, and climate impact on ecosystem. We also focus on biodiversity and human conditions, as well as how society can minimize negative impacts. And the center was formed in 2006 by Stockholm University, KTH and SMOE. It is named in honor of Professor Beck Bolin of Stockholm University, a leading climate and carbon cycle research and one of the founders of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. So we have a Bolin Center board guiding us and we also received advice from an external science advisory group consisting of leading climate scientists around the world. Today, the center is coordinated by the directorate led by geology, Professor Alistair Skelton and glaciologist Nina Kirchnes and two communicators slash coordinators. So who can be a Bolin Center member? Well, if you are interested in climate re related research and affiliated to us or work closely with one of our partners, you are most welcome to join. And a little about how we work. So today we are organized in eight different research areas led by at least two persons, ideally a man and a woman. These eight research areas receives financial resources each year for research activities. And through course, they decide which initiative that receives funding. For example, pilot studies, fieldwork, or analytical costs. And the research areas also carry out seminars open to other research areas for knowledge sharing and transfer. The center has a modeling coordination unit where the center provides shared computational resources for members working with applications requiring high performance computing capacity, for example, climate modelers. 
Our clean climate research schools spans over several departments and research areas within Stockholm University. The aim is to establish a common platform for climate research. In short, the school organizes, coordinates, and administrates interdisciplinary climate-related courses for PhD students and organized activities and events that promote networking between PhD students within the Bolin Center. We share information on our website in the weekly newsletter and we use Twitter a lot. We work close to Stockholm University Communications Department and also invite media on a regular basis to share climate news, but also to provide an opportunity for them to ask uh, questions to us. We have the Climate Answer by Scientists initiative which is a group of 15 climate experts in different fields. So we receive uh, climate related questions from different parts of uh, society. And through this group, we want to be accessible and offer scientific answers. Uh, some activities and results. In 2020, our researchers produced over 300 scientific publications. We organized the Boleyn Days, a two days of uh, knowledge sharing event for all our members. Last time with over 30 presentations. During the yearly PhD day, 20 short presentations were held in Alamagna Stockholm University. And the presenters, they were PhD uh, students and postdocs presenting to the audience on site and via Zoom. There were prizes to the best of presentations during the dinner afterward. And we'll give a yearly Bolin Center climate lecture with a selected speaker. And the climate festival is uh, our big outreach activity. So in May 2020, we gave a live stream lectures, digital activities, virtual meetings with climate scientists and climate walks for school people uh, over several days. Earlier years, the climate festival has lasted for almost a whole week in the physical real. Uh, we also produce policy briefs, which can be found on our website. So if you're interested to dig deeper into us, please visit uh, our website or follow us on Twitter or read our annual report that you can find on our website. So with that, thank you for listening. And I will hand over to the next speaker, Gustav Hegelius. So my name is Gustav Hegelius. Uh, I'm an associate professor at uh, Stockholm University and also co-lead of one of the research areas in the Bolin Center. And I will be presenting some recent research on management and climate vulnerability of Arctic wetlands. So talking about wetlands i thought it would be you know it's good to start with the definition of what wetlands really are and here i have included peatlands and wetlands um, peatlands are one type of wetlands and tend to be the type of wetlands we perhaps talk most about in the arctic wetlands in general is any area in the landscape that's saturated with water long enough to promote wetland processes which is a rather diffuse definition perhaps but it's characterized by really poorly drained soils and vegetation that is really adapted to wetlands. You see a typical northern wetland environment in this photo below here. Peatlands are one type of wetland where the surface of the soil is made up almost entirely of organic soil. That is old plant remains that have accumulated over a long time. There are a lot of different definitions here, but the most common one is that you have 40 centimeters of peat at the soil surface. And if you're in an Arctic context, <clears throat> so uh, then quite often these areas will actually be affected by something we call permafrost, that is the ground is frozen. So you see a photograph here of some of my colleagues digging into an Arctic peatland. Uh, and you see it's all, all of this brown soil is organic soil and 
the soil has also been uplifted because of the of, because of the permafrost. There's so much ice in the ground in this place that the whole wetland has been lifted up and is no longer wet. Actually, it's more it's actually quite dry at the surface because of this uplift caused by the permafrost. So then understanding permafrost is really a crucial aspect to any, any study of Arctic wetlands or, or peatlands. Um, so permafrost is any place where the ground remains frozen all year round. Most permafrost is many thousands of years old. Some permafrost is younger. You see a photograph of thawing permafrost at the bottom there that I, you also saw in Magnus' presentation, which is a very dramatic example of, of what it may look like when permafrost thaws. And you also see that the guy in the blue jacket is standing in front of a wetland that is created in this post-thaw environment. Permafrost is something that affects a very large part of the Earth. At present, it's estimated to cover around 14 million square kilometers, which is the whole area of the European Union times three. Most of this is in the Northern Hemisphere in Siberia and Canada. There's also permafrost in other areas, but Siberia and Canada and Alaska really dominate the areas. Uh, and the reason we really studied this a lot now in the recent decades, and the reason that it really matters for climate is that this region contains a lot of carbon, uh, which is basically old plant remains that have been preserved in the soil, either due to wet conditions or to frozen conditions. And we estimate something around 1500 petagrams of carbon or billion tons of carbon. Uh, that is equivalent to taking all of all of the plant material on the whole earth, so all living trees and everything, times three. So that much carbon is actually in the permafrost region and roughly a thousand of those petagrams are frozen in permafrost. And you know, this is a typical example of what the permafrost landscape looks like. This is, is permafrost tundra. You can see uh, perhaps this, you know, the, uh, let me, uh, pointer options, laser pointer. You see these sort of lines here that are quite typical of, of, of permafrost environments where you have, uh, have polygon shapes in the landscape. And these are actually massive ice that, that make these shapes. And when they start, when the clams are warming up and they thaw, they will start forming new landscape components. And here you have you know, a wetter landscape, potentially wetlands forming as this landscape shifts. Um, and wetlands have been, uh, you know, they, they, they fill a lot of, they have a lot of different roles. They're, they're important in the climate system, but they're also important for human and so social ecological systems. And there's a recent report released by the Arctic Council uh, focusing on the resilience and management of Arctic wetlands. So if you're interested in also look, learning more about societal implications, not only climate, which is what I would focus on here, and I would urge you to go to this website and actually look at a lot of the material that is available there. Um, but just an excerpt of that report, the Arctic Council uh, you know, concludes that Arctic wetlands provide important ecosystem services to Arctic and global communities, including cooling the global climate, and that they are an integral part of many indigenous people's lives, provide and sustain food security, including grazing for traditional reindeer herding. So there are a lot of aspects to why wetlands need to be managed and, and, and preserved. But I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the climate aspect. So this circle here shows, shows us something that we call the permafrost carbon feedback, which means um, a feedback to climate warming, uh, if it's a positive feedback, is something that where warming triggers something that is then reinforcing warming further. So when you have increases in temperature, this causes permafrost thaw, which in turn releases carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. And this is basically because the previously frozen plant remains and the old carbon in the soil is exposed to higher temperatures and then the microbes that live in the soil start to eat up the old plant remains. The permafrost carbon feedback is estimated to be, to be something around two petagrams of carbon per year by the end of the century. And this is equivalent to around five to 10% of, 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 of human emissions, depending on which trajectories human emissions take, of course. So it's, a, it's not something that's gonna cause runaway warming, but it's a substantial addition to the emissions that, that humans are making. And unfortunately, we are actually seeing very rapid observed permafrost thaw. So here I'm switching back and forth from a data-driven model that uh, shows us permafrost extent from 2003 to 2010 to 2017. 
And this is a really rapid thaw. It's actually more rapid than what the current generation of our system models would have predicted for, for a lot of these regions. So the thaw is potentially happening even faster than, 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 than what we had, had projected. And if we zoom into the permafrost peatlands or the wetlands specifically, thawing, it turns out that if you thaw these, these, these ecosystems, they will actually go from cooling the climate to warming the climate in a quite, you know, in a quite straightforward manner. Peatlands have been, and wetlands in the Arctic and elsewhere, have been accumulating these you know, thick packs of organic material and plant remains for thousands of years. So they have been cooling the climate basically since the end of the last ice age. Uh, and they have been basically taking up CO2 uh, and putting that into the soil and storing it. The methane balance has been rather neutral in a, in a stable permafrost peatland. But once you thaw, you go from the stable permafrost peatland into a post-thaw environment, you will still have CO2 being pulled into, the, into this ecosystem. It's quite productive and a lot of the carbon stays there. But you also have a lot of methane emissions. And because methane is a much stronger greenhouse gas than CO2, the net the net climate forcing ends up being a warming forcing to the climate, even if the CO2 is still being taken up. And on top of that, you also have this component of a lateral loss into rivers and streams of dissolved organic carbon, particulate organic carbon, nutrients, and co contaminants such as mercury that are also entering uh, the ecosystems and actually really affecting downstream, downstream ecosystems. So the take home sort of calculation of this, if, if we model, do a simple model of peatland permafrost loss into the future, this map shows us the loss of peatland permafrost with different degrees of global warming from plus 1.5 to plus 6. The net effect on radiative forcing is, is one that for several hundred years after thaw, we see a relatively strong radiative forcing that is really growing. And this is the red line is the sum of all different greenhouse gases and the yellow one is methane. So you see that the methane release is really driving this, this radiative forcing. As time passes, now I'm only showing you 200 years, as time passes, this will actually come down. And the sev after several hundred years, the wetland will actually be a sink again because the methane emissions come down and the CO2 uptake is strong enough to actually compensate for the long-term losses. But for several hundred years, we have a net, you know, a net warming uh, from, from these wetlands. Uh, and if we look at the sort of total hemisphere picture, there's this map show us the estimated net carbon loss from permafrost thaw. So this, this initial thaw pulse at two degrees warming or four degrees warming will lead us to lose many kilos of carbon per square meter initially from, from the soil, which will then be compensated over several hundred years into the future. Uh, and just uh, you know, wrapping this up a little bit, I've, for a particular study, we zoomed in on northern Fennoscandia and looking at what, are, what would happen to the permafrost and peatlands of the Baltic Sea drainage basin. And here we see the extent of permafrost in peatlands relative to the, the earlier climate period of 1961 to 1990, so more of sort of a stable case. And uh, if we use this model into the future to estimate projected thaw export, we could we, we would say that just a lateral loss of carbon alone from 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 uh, towing peatlands could be as much as five percent of the total flux of TOC into the into the to the Nordic Baltic ecosystem. So summing up, uh, northern peatlands are quite significant. They cover almost four million square kilometers and store more than four hundred petagrams of carbon. Uh, we have a large uncertainty in the extent of permafrost in this peatland still. Uh, it differs between maps, but uh, it's quite clear that we would see very substantial loss of peatland permafrost, even at stabilized uh, climate conditions. These, these ecosystems are quite vulnerable. And we also see that in a warmer world, peatlands remain a carbon sink. They still take up CO2, but increased sea, uh, methane emissions will cause a transition from net warming uh, for centuries to come. So that was what I wanted to share with you. Thank you for listening. Let's see, are there any, any questions before we move on? Oh, I don't see the chat, but I imagine that there will. Alistair. Uh, thank you, Gustav. That was really, really good presentation. Um, 
just to set that in perspective, if I understand right, two, two petagrams of additional carbon to the atmosphere, 2100, how does that, com how does that compare with what's being emitted today? Um, but with with really with, with, those numbers are so difficult to keep. Yeah, no, they are. They, they are. Yeah. So uh, today humans are emit. So uh, humans are emit. So this is two petagrams of carbon. If we recal, I, I should uh, clarify. If we recalculate methane emissions to CO two equivalents, sure. so it's actually the um, you know the combined uh, warming or net uh, net effect. And today humans are emitting roughly ten petagrams of carbon per year. So it's uh, you know two petagrams versus today 10, 10, 10 petagrams. So it's so it's massive. It is quite a lot, yeah. Uh, and it, it's also important to consider that uh, by the, but this is by twenty one hundred if we continue to let warming you know to follow the trajectory we're on right now. There's a very strong decrease in that emission if we would follow say a plus you know a one point five scenario. The thing is that when you're working in the Arctic, the difference between 1.5 and 2 is actually massive because of this, uh, you know, the, 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 the um, amplification of, of warming in northern hemispheres. There's a really big difference up there between 1.5 and 2 and 3 degrees. Uh, and it, another important aspect of that is by 2100, of course, we're hoping that human emissions will oh, be significantly lower than 10 petagrams per year, put it like that. Uh, in some you know, best case scenarios, they're even going to be negative already by then. And that also means that the permafrost will keep emitting carbon, even if human emissions have gone down. So we still have to deal with the natural feedbacks, uh, regardless of, of, of what we do with, with human emissions. It has implications for sort of long-term generational justice as well. Mm. To limit the feedbacks as quickly as we can to sort of avoid these long-term emissions is, is really crucial. Thank you, Gustav. The, the, hundred, the hundreds of years is really kind of scary at the moment. As I've always thought as a geologist, well, it doesn't, how much does it matter? Because it's not going to be there for that long, but a few hundred years is massive for humans. On policy timescales, it really is massive. For humans, it's massive. And for, for you as geologists, it's not massive, of course. But yeah. For, for, yeah. yeah, but we have to think as humans at the moment. Thank you so much, Gustav, for answering my question. Thank you. Okay, so then I would hand over the word to uh, Professor Ilona Rippenen. Many thanks for... Um giving me the opportunity to speak here. So my presentation is a little bit different facet and a different time scale uh, in the climate system. It's about aerosols and clouds and their links to climate, since we are in a bullion center session, but also a couple of words about air quality because aerosol particles are important component of air quality as well. Yeah, so I'm Ilona Ripin and I'm a professor of atmospheric science at Stockholm University. And uh, I have long ties to the Bullying Center. I was recruited as a Bullying Center um, senior lecturers once upon a time. And I've also led one of the research areas uh, a few years back, um, namely the one that had to do with aerosols, clouds, and turbulence. And uh, as a little bit of a background, if those of you who, don't, who might not know what aerosol particles are, so Atmospheric aerosol particles are any liquid or solid, so in condensed phase um, particles that float around in the air. And they can come from various sources, from any combustion processes or uh, also forests are a source of these kind of particles and so on. Um, and they do have uh, important implications for climate, which I will talk briefly about. Okay, um, so we already nicely, Gustav, uh, kind of uh, mentioned these uh, targets of the Paris Agreement. And uh, this is from the European Union strategy towards uh, climate neutrality. And so Paris Agreement sets the targets um, that we should keep the warming below two degrees or preferably even 1.5 degrees uh, warming as compared with the pre-industrial uh, era. Um, and like I said, this, this graph is now from the European Union's strategy, which gives you an idea of how uh, the policy sphere is seeing um, emission reductions um, to meet the targets of the Paris Agreement. However, to be able to, um, for us as a scientific community, to give advice to the policymakers, um, one of the key challenges that we as humans need to understand is then how does the climate actually respond to any changes in emissions? So what is exactly the 
say the <laughs> response in the global average temperature, for instance, or its regional distribution, if we were to were to bring down emissions in a certain manner. And for that, we need to understand how the the sensitivity of the climate system to say uh, changes in in greenhouse gas emissions. And um, why are clouds and aerosols then relevant for this this question? Well, the brief answer to that is that they play an important role in the Earth's radiative budget, especially, um, especially clouds. So of the solar energy that comes uh, to, the, to the Earth from the sun, um, there is actually a rather substantial fraction that's reflected uh, back to space and clouds play an important role there. Um, but also aerosol particles. So aerosol particles on one hand, they can scatter uh, or absorb in case of say black carbon, um, the, the solar uh, radiation. But then there's also the interaction between aerosol particles and cloud, clouds that's relevant. So um, at the, in the present atmosphere, basically all the cloud droplets have been formed on top of um, an aerosol particle surface. Um, so the thought kind of is that uh, if we change, if we humans change the concentrations and the properties of the aerosol particles that are present in the Earth's atmosphere, we also might perturb the conditions in which the clouds are formed. And for instance, the number of droplets that the clouds consist of, and therefore also their optical properties and their ability to reflect um, sunlight. Um, and because clouds are just an, such an important component of the Earth's radiative budget, even small perturbations to clouds and their optical properties, uh, when we're talking about the global scale, might make a big impact on the, on the energy budget of the Earth. So that's why it's really important to understand on one hand how aerosol particles um, act, um, act in the atmosphere, directly interacting with the solar radiation but also how they interact with the clouds and how, um, how these interactions have been in the past and how we expect them to be in the future. Uh, okay, here is uh, a picture from the previous um, IPCC report. Um, so this is already, we have kind of updates on this, but it's not so drastic uh, to give some numbers uh, on what I just said. So. Here is a picture that um, illustrates the, the contributions of different components on the radiative balance of the Earth um, since the industrial times. So in the top there, you see the well-mixed greenhouse gases. Uh, CO2 is on the top there. And you see that everything from the everything to the right from the central line, where you see zero in the bottom there, uh, is uh, has been warming during the industrial time, according to the present understanding. And then everything on the left has been cooling. So here on the top, we see the well-mixed greenhouse gases like CO2 and methane and so on. So they have exerted um, a large positive, so warming forcing uh, on the Earth. But there, uh, then when we look at aerosols, uh, they are in the bottom here. Um, and this is, this is a part that has been somewhat updated as you can see, but what you can see is that uh, according to the present understanding, um, the human emitted aerosols into the atmosphere, um, they have exerted a, a rather large uh, cooling um, effect on the earth. So they have sort of masked the warming effect of the greenhouse gases. Uh, but maybe two things to note here is that the uncertainty ranges in the exact magnitude of, magnitude of this cooling effect are still rather large, large so we need to uh, constrain them better. And then maybe another thing that's important to be aware of is that the, a key difference between the aerosols and say the well-mixed greenhouse gases like CO2 are that they have a completely different lifetime in the atmosphere. So uh, aerosol particles have a much, much shorter lifetime in the atmosphere and therefore also the response of the cooling effect if we change emissions of aerosols is uh, much faster, reacts sort of much faster uh, than in the case of CO2. 
So we need to constrain this climate forcing by aerosol particles and especially um, their contribution to uh, clouds to be able to really nail down exactly um, the sensitivity of the climate, or at least that would be helpful. Um, and this is basically an update, just I felt like I have to also show something from the new uh, IPCC report, the physical science basis, uh, part of the report that just came out, um, where um, they have attributed um, the observed warming um, in 2010 to 2019, relative to 1850 to 1900, um, from two different uh, kind of lines of, of evidence in, in B and C. And what you can see here is that there is the total human influence as, as it has um, been estimated. Here is then the well-mixed greenhouse gases, and here would then be the other human drivers where aerosol particles are really a large factor. And this kind of shows this masking effect that I was told about, So, or I, I, I mentioned about. So without these other human drivers, this uh, greenhouse gas induced warming that we have observed in the past, past uh, decades would have been even larger. Okay, so now the question is, how are we going to have it in the future then? And maybe there, um, it's important to note that uh, aerosol particles in the atmosphere, if you lump them all, all the different species under one umbrella, they're not only good, you know, <laughs> cooling the climate. Um, in, in, instead, uh, they are an important component of, of air quality, which is actually uh, one of the big um, environmental health hazards globally. So, Poor air quality really affects people's lives um, all over the world. So here is a picture from um, the recent, or the most recent, I think, uh, burden of disease um, from Lancet estimate, where there's a ranking of different kinds of risks. Um, this is now for women, but actually air quality uh, ends up in the same place for, for, women, uh, for men as well. Uh, where you can see the different ranking of different risks when it comes to um, disease affected life years. And maybe the point to take home from here is that globally speaking, we have air pollution of which aerosols are really important component of uh, in the number four uh, spot, just next to well-known health hazards like uh, high blood pressure, uh, dietary risks, child and maternal malnutrition, and so on and so forth. So um, we cannot keep on emitting a lot of aerosol particles into the air uh, with the thought of them cooling the climate. But instead, we know that air quality needs to be improved. And in the future, if something, we want uh, air quality and aerosol, anthropogenic aerosol concentrations from the atmospheric air to, to be reduced. So we need to take this into account when we make future projections about climate as well. Okay, so then uh, when speaking about making projections and you know these large, relatively large uncertainty bars that we still saw, uh, one comes to the question of why is it then so challenging to simulate aerosol particles? And here I have a little, oh, or I thought I had a little animation, let's see. Yeah, uh, this is a model from, from NASA. I think many of you might have seen this, but that shows kind of different aerosol components um, so that we have uh, dust here in the reddish, um, organic carbon and black carbon in green, sulfates in, in um, white and sea spray, sea salt in, in blue. And this kind of gives you an idea of the scientific challenge associated with modeling or simulating and understanding uh, aerosol particles and their uh, concentrations and their contributions to, to uh, radiative forcing and interactions with clouds. They are chemically and physically very complex under this same one umbrella um, term of aerosol. Uh, the aerosol particles can have physically 
sizes that span several orders of magnitude. They can consist, as you can see, from various chemical components. They come from both uh, natural as well as anthropogenic sources. Um, and then also their interactions with clouds are very nonlinear. So uh, this is really an interesting uh, scientific challenge where a lot of progress has been made within the Boolean Center and in the scientific community as a whole. Okay, so uh, this is just a brief schematic of what I think we need to do, especially if we want to understand the aerosol cloud interaction is uh, kind of on a fundamental level. Um, this comes to understanding how material changes face within the atmosphere. Uh, so how material is exchanged between the gas phase and the condensed phase. So kind of basic microphysics and, and chemistry. And then I think it's particularly important to understand these interactions between the water uh, that we have in the atmosphere and in the Earth system as a whole, and then the trace uh, species that, say, the aerosol particles consist of. And eventually, then, hopefully, we can help constrain uh, implications for both climate and air quality. And if you're interested in seeing kind of some of the some of the work that we have done, besides the nice website that uh, that uh, Magnus already advertised, the Boolean Center website, you can also go and look at the website of our department, which is one of the departments contributing to the Boolean Center. Um, uh, ACES, it's called. And then when it comes to the critical bottleneck of bottlenecks of understanding aerosols and clouds in the Earth system, well. We need to still fight on um, keeping keeping on to um, improve the scientific understanding of different climate forces. Um, but maybe I should also say that aerosol microphysics and chemistry are also central for indoor and outdoor uh, air quality. The outdoor air quality I already spoke about, but maybe within the pandemic, you all have also seen discussions about the role of small aerosols in. Um, the transmission of, of, of um, diseases. We need to develop new methods, especially related to, um, well, I mean, not especially related to uh, novel statistical techniques. I would also say we need to push forward in that simultaneously with developing numerical modeling and experimental techniques, and especially collection of long enough uh, time series. Uh, and then as a last kind of an important thing to keep in mind and where Boolean Center has made a big contribution is to enhance the exposure and knowledge transfer uh, between the different uh, communities that are working on different aspects of the climate system and the earth system. So the human component should never be forgotten even in the realm of natural science. Um, and uh, within sort of my own research, if you want to put it that way, one of the big initiatives that that um, we are coordinating together with the co um, Boolean Center scientist Annika Ekman uh, is a big EU project called Forces, uh, which you can also go to the website to learn more about, um, which is all about constraining the forcing, the, the, the radiative forcing associated with, with aerosol particles and their interactions with clouds, where we have partners all around uh, Europe. So uh, with this, I would like to thank you for your um, attention. And I'm looking forward to future collaborations within the realm, realm of uh, CIVIS, perhaps. And also, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, thank you, Alona. I was politely giving the other people in the room a chance to ask a question, but I'm definitely going to. Super presentation. Thank you so much. Um, the, when one thinks about this, the masking effect, you see the pedagogic challenge of how, because it would mean that we get into some, the, that uh, if I understand right, that um, as we reduce fossil fuel emissions, we actually can expect additional warming, which I see would be a, a challenge to explain to the public. But one of the things, um, the, que the question I wanted to ask you is how much of the aerosol masking is aerosols that we can affect that are anthropogenic and how much is like um, Saharan dust and sea spray and things that maybe we cannot affect? That's a great question. And actually, I think that that is, uh, I, I, I'm hesitant to, especially since uh, I'm being recorded, I'm hesitant <laughs> to give you <laughs> 
tell me exact number. Um, because, Turn the recording off. <laughs> no, but this is actually really an excellent question that we as a community are also um, really focused on answering because to knowing exactly what fraction is um, anthropogenic versus biogenic and constraining the biogenic fraction it's actually quite an important contribution to these uncertainty bars that I showed. Um, so, I mean, I, could, I can say that um, there are numerous um, and different kinds of, um, of natural sources of aerosol, like I mentioned, sea spray, um, forests, um, volcanic eruptions, and so on. And then, you know, the human influences have come on top of that. Uh, and the question is really, uh, if we now would reduce all the anthropogenic emission, what would exactly uh, the aerosol loadings be? And I mean, I don't think we have an exact answer to that because, you know, the aerosols also have dynamics that somehow buffer. It doesn't linearly, the concentrations do not linearly change with the emissions. Um, so that, that's a great question that we're actually trying to uh, answer within the scientific community. And there is a lot of focus on that. And I'm, that's just, a, what do I say, like a illustration of some of the complexities related to understanding the aerosol loadings. Thank you, Alona. I'm sorry you're being recorded. I would like to <laughs> you, okay. you can, I can just, speculate. <laughs> I can just say that a significant fraction. So Thank I you. mean, we're, to, we're, we're probably talking of like uh, tens of percents. Okay. Um, of comparable comparable um, uh, fraction, and um, of course this uh, varies local, locally and regionally a lot. So that you know you have regions that are entirely dominated by the by the um, natural sources, and then regions that are dominated by the anthropogenic. Thank you. Sorry, was someone else also trying to ask a question on top of my super long and unclear speculation? Nope. Then I think we move on to Alistair, from whom I guess I stole some time. Sorry about that. It's okay. I, did, I chose to ask the question. That's my fault. <laughs> Thank you, Lona. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, hold on. I still have a light, slight screen issue here. Okay, now we've got that solved. So I'm going to tell you about a project I've been working on together with uh, colleagues from uh, the Boleyn Center and from the Karolinska Institute, the Medical University, it's in Stockholm, where we've been looking at lockdown measures and how um, which reduce emissions and that uh, do not have negative effects of quality of life. Just brief background. Um, I'm going to show you here a figure constructed from the Global Carbon Project um, and modeling by, uh, by Robbie Andrews, which uh, is a comparison uh, which, in which I'm comparing emissions with 2019 as, our, as my base year. And uh, we see, obviously, it's not as, as expected, past emissions rise to that uh, uh, a maximum of 100% in 2019 and a fall in 2020 of 7%. <clears throat> That's the largest emissions drop that has happened ever. And it's an it, one could view it as an amazing achievement in some respects. It's also pretty well online with the emissions reductions that are needed to give us a 66% chance of keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees. But as we all know, 2020 was a very, very different year. Uh, this sign isn't Swedish, and it's a sign that we would never have understood summer 2019. How it says distance is, is equal to care, and how could it possibly be? Uh, distance is nothing like care. You hug each other to show care. But we've learned that it was a very different year, and we've learned a very, and we've uh, unfortunately um, experienced a crisis. Um, but taking from that crisis and the 7% emissions reduction, we pose the question. Um, uh, well, thinking about what is the cause of that emissions reduction and uh, was it all bad? Was everything that was changed in 2020 bad? And I'm sp referring specifically to the restrictions that we experienced. 
Uh, and the question we're asking ourselves is what are the low hanging fruit for emissions reductions? What do we do during the pandemic that we could actually consider continuing with? And of those things that we did during the pandemic, which are likely to have a positive effect on the climate and pull the emissions down. So scary things like permafrost thawing maybe don't have to happen quite so severely. Um, we conducted a study uh, in the Stockholm area um, and the study went out as follows. Um, we, uh, it was based on a questionnaire uh, where we collected background data about who the, the respondents were. We used a standard WHO quality of life survey tool um, to, and uh, we then looked at the Swedish Health Authority's recommendations um, and how um, asking whether people followed them and how they affected their quality of life. The key point is it's recommendations. Sweden was the perfect country to do this study because we were allowed to look at complacency. Did people actually follow the recommendations? Um, the data collection was done through a survey. It was sent out by the Karolinska Institute. So it didn't necessarily appear to have anything to do with climate. Um, it was distributed via a local paper in Stockholm that was free, um, the, um, social media. And we also took a cohort of university students um, and then compared those different data sets to see if there was any difference between them. We found none. Um, Emissions data was taken using the environmental pressure from household consumption, expenditure by purpose and substance, which is a very long phrase, um, but data collected by Statistics Sweden. And then a uh, um, uh, degree of variability of, so was obsessed using, using a Monte Carlo simulation. The background data shows that our respondents were 746 people um, and there's a strong gender bias. Um, the uh, the bulk, the majority of persons responding were female, which meant we had to do a um, second analysis to see whether the that actually created a bias or not. Um, and we we so we found no difference between male and female responses. Um, on the other hand, the power of our analysis is fairly low, given men around about under two hundred. Um, so, looking at the Swedish health or, uh, health authority recommendations that we an we analyzed them all: fairness, um, social distancing hand hygiene, avoiding places where crowds get together, shops, restaurants, indoor gyms and entertainment venues, and avoiding uh, travel, regional, national, international at various times during the pandemic for work and pleasure. So we looked at all of them of fairness um, and uh, social distance and, hand, and we asked set, um, a set of questions in the questionnaires. For social distancing and hand hygiene, we asked if people actually did, we take the example of social distancing, did people actually do it? Did people socially distance? And how did that change quality of life? And we had to use a, a standard Likert scale for deciding uh, and then quantified that as best as one can, the semi-quantitative data. Um, we look, uh, when we were talking about avoiding crowding and taking the example of shops, we asked the same questions about avoiding shopping for non-essential items. But then we had to ask, what, and for many of these questions, what do people do instead? Did they do online shopping instead? instead? Did they alternately wait to do their shopping? Or did they simply not buy the non-essential items they were thinking of purchasing? And again, how did that affect quality of life? Um, moving on to travel, um, taking the example of international travel, we're asking people, did they avoid it? Um, and if they did, what did they do instead? Did they travel within their own region or country, or did they simply stay at home? And how did that change affect their quality of life? Um, looking at um, the, the results, uh, what we found, um, so each of these figures is going to look exactly the same. It's going to tell you uh, what, the, what we're looking at, social distancing, how many responses, in this case 733, effect on quality of life, where red is negative and yellow and green are positive or neutral. Um, so social distance was experienced as 40% positive or neutral. Um, it had no effect on emissions. The change of emissions is, is per person per year. Um, I guess one would have probably worked that out. Hand washing was considered a positive thing mostly or neutral, and it had a very small po uh, effect on emissions that increases our emissions slightly. Um, Avoiding crowded places uh, like shops actually was considered neutral to positive by 55% of the sample set. 
and it had a fairly substantial effect on emissions after correction for online shopping and waiting to shop. Uh, restaurants, again, were fairly similar. Um, avoiding restaurants, so people finding eating, that we were looking, comparing eating at home, taking takeaways, which doesn't do much benefit, but having, having corrected for takeaway food, we're at a, um, we're, there's sub substantial emissions change. Avoiding crowded places, again, indoor gyms has a smaller, uh, uh, a smaller effect, as does entertainment venues. Avoiding travel was very, very different, whether it was for pleasure or for work. It was experienced very negatively avoiding travel for pleasure, although the emissions reductions were substantial, and that didn't matter whether it was national, regional, national, or international. It was viewed as negatively. Whereas avoiding for travel for work had a lesser effect on emissions because of the way one chooses to travel for work, um, and, uh, but it was actually seen as either neutral or positive by the majority of our respondents. Uh, for regional, national, and international travel. So to collect, calculate a low-hanging, we calculated a low-hanging fruit factor, and this was very, very simple, uh, although it's expressed in lots and lots of numbers. All that we do here is we multiply change of quality of life, which we normalize to the, uh, to the range between the minimum and the maximum for the different categories we looked at. Um, and we multiply that by change in emissions, which we also normalize to the minimum and the maximum of values. And then we multiply by compliance. Did people actually follow the restrictions or not? Um, and this allowed us to do a ranking of the, so we could pick out which are, and, and to repeat what we're looking for, what changes are, do not affect our quality of life negatively and have a, are effective in terms of emission reductions. Um, looking first at travel, um, the, the ranking is shown here and all the categories are there, but I'm just highlighting the ones from travel. Uh, the number has, the actual value of the number means nothing. It's just for comparison. So avoiding travel for work came up as something that has significant effect on uh, reducing emissions. And it's also viewed as relatively positive among the population. Whereas avoiding travel for pleasure, uh, it actually also had a good effect on reducing emissions, but it was so negative, it would not be a low hanging fruit and we wouldn't recommend targeting it. If we're looking at uh, avoiding crowded places, the surprise for us is that avoiding, avoiding shops was actually viewed very positively. Not buying that item you didn't really need was something that's, that the Stockholm population were happy about. So that made it rank very, very highly. Restaurants, indoor gyms and entertainment fall lower down the list. Uh, social distancing and hygiene, hand hygiene were neither had no effect on them, no effect on emissions, or actually they make it worse. Um, and also, we're not considered um, social distancing is considered as not very positive. So to conclude, um, the following measures were found to reduce emissions effectively with little or no loss of quality of life: avoiding travel for work, and avoiding shops, and to some extent, restaurants. So our the recommendation from this study is campaigns for reducing emissions should be focusing on um, reducing travel to work, online meetings such as these, and also encouraging people not to buy that piece of shit that they don't really want, or buy that present for someone that you know they don't want anyhow, but you feel you should do. Um, the, if you want to read more, this is where the, this is where the work's published in Earth's Future. Um, thank you very much. And I'll stop there exactly at 11 o'clock. So thank you all for participating in this uh, Cups and Cakes seminar. Uh, uh, yeah, I just say thank you to all of you. And uh, as you know, this has been recorded and you will find this recording on the Risk for Civis website in the future. So everybody who wants to see these science talks or introduction by Magnus again, just go back to the webpage and, and see it again.